When it comes to building your first game or just trying to establish yourself as an upcoming studio, one of the most hardest aspects and sometimes most frustrating parts to deal with is the push for graphical power or art in your game. As we've said, video games first and foremost are a visual medium, and if people don't like the look of your game or it looks low quality or low budget, they're not going to give it a second look or even try and download it even if there is a demo or whatnot. And this can be very frustrating for developers because as we've said, game design features multiple disciplines. Most people who are great programmers aren't exactly great artists, and vice versa. And chances are, most of you watching this right now aren't the most amazing designer, programmer, artists all put together. And for a lot of people, it can be a struggle sometimes to look at your game and know, I have this greatly designed game, it's interesting, it's unique, it's innovative, but I can't do any art or afford any art, and people are going to give this game the time of day. And this can be a killer for a lot of games. But when it comes to game design or just presenting your video game, we've talked about the differences between art or graphical power and aesthetics or style. And that's going to be our major topic for this video. What is more important, art or aesthetics? And it's very easy to conflate the two together, because we see this, especially with how much the bar has been raised from independent AAA development over this past decade. We have games like, again, Red Dead Redemption, uh, Breath of the Wild, God of War on the AAA side. Then we have stuff like Undertale, um, Fury, and many other titles, even something like Return of the Obra Dinn being a great example. And there's going to be a lot of game footage in this video because obviously we're talking about game art. But before we get to that, I want to at least talk very briefly about the differences between the two from a design and development point of view. When we talk about raw graphical power or graphical fidelity, this is a lot, e a lot easier to put into words because it is pretty much about the technical side of a game engine. You know, how many, how many hairs on my arm can an engine render? If I'm in a forest, can I examine every exact leaf detail on every tree in this game? Do I see my footprints in the snow or in the mud? Do these buildings look so realistic that it looks like I'm just literally staring out a window? And raw graphical power, like I said, it's easy to measure. It's the same thing with the technical parts of a car. If I have an engine, sorry about my voice cracking there. If I have an engine that puts out 600 horsepower and no engine that puts out 1,000, well, 1,000 is greater than 600, right? And this is where a lot of people will immediately turn to the AAA side. Because AAA development has the money and the resources to make use of the most powerful game engines on the market. Again, why games like Call of Duty, Battlefield, the Nintendo games we mentioned, and many, many other titles that have either come out or will be coming out this year, all have that you know first look wow factor. Again, you look at something like Smash Bros. Ultimate, and you immediately know what it is. The same thing when you look at a commercial for Call of Duty and you're just blown away by the visuals and the explosions and all that. But with that said though, aesthetics are a lot harder to put into words. It's something that probably most of you watching this right now, when you see a game that works, you know it. But it's hard to explain why it works. And the, I guess the dirty little secret about aesthetics is that when we talk about aesthetics, this can be in any video game. Whether it is something as simple as an 8-bit game from 25 years ago, to again, a fully 3D amazing title that was released this year. But understanding the differences between the two takes a lot of studying, and again, it takes a lot of examples. Uh, when it comes to aesthetics, though, to briefly define it, it is about the game having a unified theme or brand 
or style to it. It doesn't feel like you just took various elements from other games and put it in random spots. You know, I have a, a health bar over here, a game menu over there, we have a boss gauge here, there's a score floating around over here, etc. But it's about your game having a look that is not only unified, but is also clean. And using the term clean here even adds more complexity to this discussion. Because you can have a game that looks really strong graphically, but it doesn't really look like everything is all together. And as we're going to switch to some game footage, or game footages, in the next few seconds, we're going to look at games from across the spectrum in terms of graphical versus aesthetic value. But before, I guess, Josh Ross, <laughs> we have our little, uh, uh, I guess, theory of art lesson, here's a quick shout out to our Patreon backers. Thank you to our Patreon backers, and if you'd like to continue this discussion on game design, check out our Discord channel, link down below. Our first little example here is from Resident Evil 7. Resident Evil 7, besides redefining the Resident Evil franchise once again, also debuted their own unique engine for the game. And as you can see from a detailed point of view, the game looks great. It looks with these en lovely enemies trying to get me there. You can see the graphical detail of the environment, and the earlier parts of this game, when you're inside against the Baker home, has a... It's very hard to explain. It looks disgusting, but that's the point. <laughs> that it's supposed to be this very decrepit, decrepit, horrible looking place, but the detail is there. With that said though, it's one of those examples of a game where grab from an aesthetics point of view, it doesn't really, I think, stick out. Obviously these molded as I play Ring Around the uh Rosie here with, they are part of the brain of Resident Evil 7. But if I just showed you stock footage of me running around the boat or in the Baker home without any context, how many of you would know that I was playing Resident Evil 7? I'm actually curious. Let me know what you think in the comments about that question. But the point is, when it comes to these kinds of video games, or when it comes to the AAA market, there is definitely a push for graphical fidelity above a strong aesthetics. That doesn't mean you can't have both. Again, Nintendo has been really great at giving their games a strong aesthetics. You look at a Mario game, or Splatoon, or Zelda, you immediately know what that game is, no questions asked. But, like, right here, with this footage of me walking around this little, I think I'm in a salt mine, or something like that, if that four-legged uh, mold that didn't just pop up and is trying to do something right there, would you have known that I was playing Resident Evil 7? But, with that said, like, we have lots of footage to get to, so we're going to be jumping in and around to various games, and let's look at another one next. How's that for a turn? Going from Resident Evil to The Binding of Isaac. And if you somehow have found this video and have no idea what this game is, then you go, you better go buy my first book. There is some, uh, some super liminal messaging for you, everyone. But The Binding of Isaac, as well with the other games from Team Meat and Edmund McMillan, all feature very simple graphics. Again, this is not a game that's going to be pushing your computer or your console like Resident Evil 7 was, or uh, Red Dead Redemption 2. But, this is a great example of having a strong aesthetic. The game itself has this very... It's, again, it's very cartoony, but it's also like very much like a shock humor or disgusting aesthetic. Again, it's very hard to put into words. But, everything about this game is unified. From how the characters look, to our very weird looking enemies and power-ups. Again, this is a game that you show footage of this game to someone, and either they will immediately know what this game is, or they will know that this is something that is different from everything else. And when it comes to getting a game like this, again, it is about having a vision for what your game is going to look like. 
And that vision goes beyond just saying, I want to render everybody's hair with perfect fidelity. It's about, again, coming up with what your game, what you want your game to look like, and then building everything around it. With The Bunny of Isaac, for instance, even the UI has like elements of like that 8-bit aesthetics. The map menu or the map UI in the upper right hand, that is that comes from like old school games. These rooms are all designed to emulate the original Legend of Zelda. All these elements together combine into having a unique look to the buying of Isaac. And like we've said, it's hard to put into words why one of these things work or why it doesn't. But I'm pretty sure that Edmund, Edmund and the rest of his team did spend time fine-tuning the graphics and the aesthetics for the buying of Isaac. The important point before we move on to another video is that even though, like we said in the first part, that this game looks simple, it still took a lot of time and work to get to this point. And that's one of the key points about aesthetics versus graphics. That graphical fidelity does require money and time. You need a powerful engine to be able to do all this. But aesthetics take a lot of work as well. Once you've settled on the aesthetics for your game, that is one of those decisions like your core gameplay loop that must remain fixed. Nobody in their right mind would want to change a game's complete art style halfway through development. That would be just one of those very major blunders. But let's go to another game and we'll talk a little bit more about art. Returning to the AAA very quickly, we have of course Dark Souls. And the Dark Souls franchise is again another example of having a unified and a well thought out aesthetic. The game itself does still look good from a graphical point of view, but a lot of that really rests in this uh, gloomy or, you know, very much a broken down aesthetic. That this is a world that's not thriving and happy. This is a dead or dying place. And again, everything about the game just speaks about that aesthetics. Now, one reason why I chose Dark Souls and games like it is that the Dark Souls, and even going back to Demon Souls, each world has a different theme to it. And it's not just about saying, I'm only going to be using the color gray and that's it. In Dark Souls and in Demon Souls, you have sections that are in snow areas. You have light, you have dark, forest, fire, etc., etc. And it's important to not be too much locked in terms of making an aesthetic choice. Again, gray is not an aesthetic. You want to have detail, you want things that stand out while remaining true to your brand. This is footage from the final fight in Dark Souls 3. And again, you can notice the detail around in terms of the dying ground, the various weapons stuck in the ground like right there. And despite only having a few colors on screen, everything again works. It's all in sync together. and. This is one of those big points about aesthetics that like we mentioned with the buying of Isaac. That the simple stuff still takes time and work to get it right. And I'm sure as From Software worked on the formula going as far back as Demon Souls, they probably went through several iterations of UI design, of graphic styles, etc. And I also want to elaborate on that for a second. When we talk about aesthetics, UI is also a part of that. And the games that have the best aesthetics or that best branding will integrate the UI in some way, shape, or form. Now, with Dark Souls' case, the UI elements do, in some sense, get in the way of the graphics. Again, we have bars in the upper left, you have those little window panes in the bottom left. But it's kept minimalistic to of prevent from distracting you while you're playing the game. Right now, while you're watching this footage, most of you are probably focusing on this big guy who keeps jumping around and trying to cut me, rather than watching individual bars go up and down. And again, 
the less the player is distracted and the more they can focus on your style is ultimately going to be the better. With that said, we have one more example we're going to switch to, and we are going once again completely in the opposite direction. And we are now at West of Loathing. I think we can all agree is much more powerful graphically compared to Resident Evil 7, right? But West of Loathing is, of course, from the Kingdom of Loathing brand, which makes use of stick figures and, again, a very basic looking game. However, this is a great example of, again, the power of aesthetics. And when we, I spoke to the creators of this, I think on a podcast last year or the year before, and we talked about the work that goes into making a game look like this. They've also written several pieces on Gamma Sutra as well. But when it comes to West of Loathing, that despite being very simple to look at, you can notice that there is some very detailed stuff here. You can see the shadow on the items in the foreground. You can see how things move around when the character goes from left to right. View the area, such as the uh, bone pile, is really great in terms of, again, having a interesting look to it. And ultimately, that's what makes the power of aesthetics work. Is that this is, again, one of those games that the look is very basic, but it really conveys what it wants to be almost immediately. You look at footage of this game, you immediately know that this is something that is not a ordinary looking game. And it's very hard to find other games that look like this. Even again, despite how simple these stick figures look up there. There is detail here in terms of trying to get everything to work. And I know when I spoke to them when they wrote that piece that they did spend a lot of time trying to get the graphical engine to look right. I'm going to move in and around here, try and show some more footage, too. So here we have our character walking, and yes, stupid walking is a thing in this game, and it's the greatest thing ever. But again, you can see how simple everything looks, but it's also striking as well. And again, it's one of those things that really separates some of the best games from one another. We could even load up footage of stuff like Shovel Knight, Odalis, um, what was it, uh, Curse Castle, and etc. That even when you look at retro style games or 8 bit style, you can still do a lot with having a specific look and feel to your game. And when it works, ultimately that is going to help your game more than just raw graphical power. And we're going to begin to wrap things up here. But to kind of summarize, video games first and foremost are still visual. If your game doesn't have a good look to it, people aren't going to try it out unless heavy word of mouth spreads about it. But too many people will confuse good looking with strong graphics or powerful graphics. And as we bounce back and forth between AAA and independent, just because your game has a very strong engine, doesn't mean it's going to stick out aesthetically. Like we said with the Resident Evil 7 example, if I just showed you stock footage of my character running around with no enemies, and I didn't say anything, would you have known that was Resident Evil 7 if you didn't play it? But when we look at games that do have a strong aesthetics, like West of Loathing here, Dead Cells, and the like, that it makes the game stronger than it would be otherwise. And more importantly, a strong aesthetic is something that when you start putting screenshots together and start showing people, it looks more impressive. Because it looks like you have a strong idea of how your game was supposed to look and you follow through on it. With that said though, I know somebody's gonna point out, what if I just make a game that looks like ASCII graphics? Or, you know, just literally squares running around like what Thomas was alone. And yes, that can work, but again, it all comes down to creating a unique look for your game and having that follow through. Again, with stuff like the Soulsborne franchise, it's not just about saying my game is grim and dark and that's it. Too many games, especially in the horror genre, like to say we're going to use the aesthetic of 
pure black that you can't see a damn thing. And that is not an aesthetic. Aesthetic is about, again, having a unique look to your game that makes it stand out. If I can't see anything in your game, then <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. And to wrap it up here, my final question for the people watching. Can you think of really good examples of games that we haven't mentioned that did that had an amazing aesthetic while still being very low quality or not having strong graphics? Let me know in the comments below, but thank you so much for watching this video. Be sure to check out our Discord and Patreon, all that great stuff linked down below. Come back for more daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where exactly are in science of games. If you're looking for another book about game design, be sure to check out my first title, 20 Essential Games to Study, out now. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoy things, be sure to do all the liking and subscribing that the kids are doing these days. Check out our Discord channel link down below where we hang out and chat game design, and come back later tonight for our regular streamings. But that's it, and tune in for more great content here and on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games.